All right, now we're, we're happy to be joined by the two Trevors, Trevor Blennon, who is in France uh, currently, and Trevor Hogan, who is in Dublin, if I'm not mistaken, Trevor. Uh, so thanks very much for joining us, lads. Uh, we appreciate you giving up your time. Um, Trevor Brennan, we might start with you. Uh, we were speaking to Simon Zebo and Donnie Ryan a little while ago, who have been in Paris for the duration of the lockdown and everything that's been happening. Um, how is life in Toulouse treating you? How have the last couple of months been? Well, listen, lads, it could be a worse place to be in lockdown. You know, we're in the south of France. It's 28 degrees. There's a swimming pool out in the back garden, so, and, and a gym that the lads put in. So, no, listen, it could be worse places. Uh, no, happy enough. Uh, obviously, the hardest thing is uh, the bar has been shut down for the last uh, 10 weeks. But uh, apart from that, no, I, I can't complain. But uh, as I say, listen, it's tough times for everyone, isn't it, lads? Mm, it's true, yeah. Yeah, just on the on the subject of that, um, obviously hospitality has been hit massively all over the world. Really, there's kind of nowhere that's been immune from it. Is there is there kind of a, a roadmap back to normality to some extent in France now? Well, we're just getting news today. Actually, uh, it's funny they're only announced that, but the bars and restaurants are going to be open on Monday or Tuesday. Sorry, uh, but what they're putting in place is obviously a distance between tables. So. You might lose probably between 30 and 40 percent of, of your turnover, obviously taking out every second table and stuff and spreading people out. Uh, just about staff wearing masks, uh, chefs wearing masks, uh, anyone carrying food or taking orders have to carry, you know, wear a full face mask. Uh, it's just, I think it's a bit OTT panic stations, but listen, it's just something we have to go with and just take it day, day, day by day. But, um, we're, we're ready anyway to open up. We've been in there for the last three, four weeks. I'm sure Jerry is the same. Just you know, keeping on top of things, cleaning lines, uh, cleaning shelves, taking the opportunity to get the old chewing gum off the tables and the chairs, and cleaning the toilets like they've never been cleaned before. <laughs> now we're ready. Uh, fingers crossed we'll be back open and we'll give it a good lash. Uh, can you just can, can you just cover can you cover your mic kind of in between talking maybe yeah 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 one of them got a, one of them, one of them got a tin whistle I've, I'm still minding the two kids here man one of them got a Jerry, will you put their kids away will you uh, they're being very selfish here one they're actually <laughs> if I was to show you they have like a, one of them Batmobile oh, things good, as well good, so I uh, regret hey, hey lads can you go away just <laughs> Right, I'll, I'll cover my mic in between. Sorry. You need to fuck off, Jerry. I thought you heard you say fuck off there, Jerry. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, what, what are they saying to you on the social distancing? Is it one meter, two meter over there, or what? No, it's one, one and a half meters in between tables, Jerry. But you can have up to ten people on one table. Trevor, we, Trevor Hogan, we move on to you. Uh, obviously, different experience. You're in Ireland. Uh, you've been working with Leinster. How have you found? The detachment from rugby that has happened very suddenly. How have you adjusted to that? Uh, I'm I'm grand. It's, uh, it's when you hear the stories like what what Trevor's talking about there, the reality of life for people trying to get on with their daily daily existence. Uh, and there's a lot of worse people often. But I am um, I'm lucky enough. My wife is is still working. She's she's working away. But it means I've had to you know do do a bit more with the kids at home, which is which is great. It's, great time you'll never probably normally have um but it's it's intense and i'd say i've aged some amounts in the last couple of months but like it's nothing compared to what everyone else is going through um hopefully there is some sort of solution in, in the next couple of months that, that that rugby can get back up and running so we can we can get on the pitch again with uh, the academy and, and the younger lads but it's in that context of how devastating. I'm just realizing how how how, um, how much damage is going to be done to the economy, not just for this year, for the next couple of years. And we just have to keep the reality of what that's going to impact on on, on everyone, rather than just our own small uh, issues we might have. So, yeah, it's kind of I'm grand, but you just have in the back of your mind how bad it's going to be for everyone for for a good good while to come. And Trev, you kind of you're obviously working with with Lens and your culture now, as as we've said. But you, it wasn't a direct transition after you finished up playing. You you were obviously went back and and studied, uh, completed your studies to to be a teacher, and you kind of moved into coaching again uh, yeah. more in more recent years. 
Um, what was it that was it spending that bit of time away from rugby made you realize how much you missed it and how much you, you wanted to be involved in a, in a professional setup again? Or, or how did you come to kind of move back into rugby? Yeah, it was, it was a bit of luck and it was a bit of a kind of crossover between teaching and the qualities you'd use as a teacher and a coach and just the job coming up or a, a new role coming up working with the academies in the four provinces. And it just had a great blend for me that, that, that you'd be working with young enough kids similar to school age and trying to develop them and, and seeing them come through. It was just, I hadn't really considered a, a life of a professional coach a, at all because as Jerry and Trevor will know and yourself, Duncan, the intensity of, of the, the, the professional top end coaching is, is it's relentless. Like, so I wasn't ever intending on going down that road. And then just, this, this kind of came up as a role uh, with the academy. Um, so that was perfect. And it's just, uh, it's just coming up to maybe four years now when I'm back in it. It was either that or the teaching. So it kind of, works together all you know the, the role matches matches each other pretty well so I'm, I'm just delighted that uh that that that's the job I have at the moment but um yeah it was when I finished it was a long time where I, I kind of found out what I wh where I was going to go I was I was kind of just reassessing everything I was doing a lot of getting a lot of uh, political work and activism and stuff which I'd hopefully get back into at some stage but I'm, I'm, I'm happy enough where I am now with the with the family and um just keeping the head down with the, with the coaching. Just to follow on from what, what you finished up with there in, in relation to, you've obviously been very prominent um, in your involvement with, with various political matters over the years. Um, and you were kind of, you were probably the first person in the professional era to kind of have, um, uh, to, to be a figurehead of campaigns and to be kind of involved kind of at a really hands-on level with a lot of things. Do you see, the role of sport kind of becoming slightly more political in, in the years since you would have left or, or do you think there's an issue with regard to uh, athletes being expected to keep their mouths shut about uh, about whatever it might be and just shut up and, and do yeah. their job on the pitch or on the track or whatever it might be? Yeah, it's, it's a fascinating question, Duncan. I, 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 uh, I think it depends on the individual. Like, I was fairly low profile, so it wasn't as if I was going to be making any major waves, but I think... Uh, if people are genuine and they feel passionate about issues and, and injustice or whatever's uh, going on in their own communities and society, if they if they speak out and if they're genuine about it, it doesn't matter how much of a profile they have. I think people would uh, generally take take a, take account of them. But like you said, I think in the last few years, last decade, you know, some lots of sports people are, are shown courage to stand up, and probably none more so than than Colin Kaepernick in in, in, um, in America and seeing what he's gone through. But, you know, the issues aren't going away. And uh, with, with what's going to happen in the next few years off the back of this pandemic, um, you'd be worried that inequality and all the rest is just going to get worse. Um, and you'd hope that people will be able to see, not just for their own lives and try and help other people um, to, to get through things. And sports people, will, I think, have a big role in that. But like you mentioned there, there's a tricky balance if you're, you know, a sports player that don't want to rock the boat in, with your with your organisation, your employers. You just want to keep the head down and focus on what's in front of you. And lots of sports people are like that. They kind of they just want to stay in the moment and stay with dealing with what's in front of them. That's understandable. But uh, I think in the next while we'll we'll all kind of have to stick together as much as possible and back each other up. Yeah. Uh, Trevor Brennan, going back to you, um, you you mentioned just before we started recording that uh, Josh and Danny have been training away out the back. Obviously, Danny um, featured heavily uh, in the Irish press um, for some post-match interviews he gave during the, the Junior World Cup campaign a while back. Um, how are they both getting on? I think everyone would like to hear an update on, uh, uh, on their progress uh, in the rugby front. Yeah, going well. Um... Obviously, yeah, that was 2018 after the World Cup uh, when they interviewed him. I, I don't think uh, the guy was expecting a, a North Side Dublin accent, you know, from the Liberties. Uh, <laughs> uh, so uh, when they beat, beat uh, England in the final. Um, no, he's going well. He left Toulouse two years ago. He went down to Montpellier. Unfortunately, uh, last year in a top 14 game, he tore the muscle of the quad off the bone so he's been out for the last six months he was due to make a comeback in uh, March but the yeah, end of March but um, obviously this Covid stopped that but I think that might have been you know I think 
for someone like anyone coming back from an injury, whether it's a cruciate ligament or you know a bad ankle injury, shoulder injury, you know, the more time you to get the rehab, the better. So uh, you know he's got his weight down from 140 kilos to 130 kilos, and he's he's lost that let's say that baby fat and turned it into muscle. So hopefully that'll stand to him next year, and he'll hit the ground running with Montpellier and. Uh, he can nail down the start starting spot in in in, in uh, the Montpellier team. The other fellow, Josh, um, he was captain of the under 18s last year. Uh, well, this year you'd say um, they won the Six Nations. Then he got called into the under 20s, travelled over to Argentina. Uh, he didn't get any game time, but he picked up another. He picked up a World Cup medal as well in Argentina this year. Uh, he came back. He captained uh, the French team. I think the two games in the under 20s this year in the Six Nations, but. He's just signed a three-year deal with Toulouse, and uh, I think we could see him, even though he's only 18, but he's six foot six, uh, 18 and a half stone. So I think we could see him featuring in a couple of games with Toulouse next year, whether it's the top 14 or European. But yeah, he's a guy who's absolutely savagely driven. I suppose when you're a rugby player and you look back in your own career, I suppose it's different for guys who had a father or an uncle or someone who played rugby. I never had anyone in my family play rugby, so... I made a lot of mistakes and I had to learn the hard way. So <laughs> I suppose, you know I mean? I'm always giving the guys advice and what to say, whether it be in, whether it be in a press interview after a game, a post-match, uh, you know, um, how they, you know, hold themselves on the pitch, off the pitch. Obviously, we live in a, a, an era of uh, social media, Facebook, Twitter, uh, Instagram, Snapchat. So, you know I mean? You know, all, the, all them things. But obviously... You know, I mean, we all look back and we all have regrets. I suppose, I suppose some of the regrets I might have had is, you know, they didn't train as hard, or I could have trained hard, or I could have drank less, and yeah, it's all, it's all them things. But listen, they, they only, they, you can only give them advice and guide them. You know, what I mean, but they are their own men at the end of the day, and they, they'll make their own choices. But yeah, they're going well at the moment. Thank God, fingers crossed, Duncan. I, I, yeah, I, I know. I know you've um, been asked this and answered this question plenty of times before about um, you know. There's obviously um, been uh, you know big questions about whether they would ever come back. I know. I know it's kind of realistically they probably won't. But does it uh, does it ever kind of disappoint you the fact that these lads are quite possibly going to be good enough to play Test rugby and that uh, it'll be wearing blue rather than green? Ah, uh, well, listen. You know, I mean, I got my chance with Leinster. I got my first chance, you know, when it comes to rugby with Leinster. And obviously, you know, Ireland. So I feel uh, very privileged, you know, that Ireland and Leinster gave me my chance. But uh, I also feel very privileged that Toulouse and France have given me my second chance, whether it be in life and in rugby. And, and certainly, uh, you know, we've been adopted by Toulouse. You know, I suppose they're passionate, uh, as they are in Munster and Cork and Limerick about the rugby. Um, it's the same, like, I say, Trevor, Mick Galway, Keith Wood, Peter Clottishy, they go walk anywhere in Limerick, Cork, Kerry, and, and they recognise, you know, whether they haven't put on a jersey for 15, 20 years, just they'll always be a part because they've given something to that jersey at the time that they were playing, that they're, you know, I mean, blood, sweat and guts. And I think it's the same in Toulouse. And I think they like the fact, because... In France, we see so many people coming into this country and picking up a contract, big money for two, three years, heading back to New Zealand, Argentina, South Africa, England, wherever it is. But I think the fact they like the fact that I stayed in France, I opened a couple of bars, I set up a business, I created employment, I did a bit of coaching when I stopped playing with underage teams in Toulouse. And now the fact that my kids have come through the system, you know, I never pushed my kids, it was just a natural thing. If they just, you know, start playing rugby, whatever. Like, like myself, when you're 12, 13, out in the field with a couple of mates and then join the club and they got picked up by the underage system. So, listen. Uh, sorry, Duncan, I'm rambling on here. Um, but, uh, no, that's really it, Duncan. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you're all good. Uh, uh, yeah, Trev, Trev Hogan, um, it, it, Having a look at the two teams there, we, we thought we'd have a we, we we'd have a bounce off yourself and and and, and big Trev in, in France there, and uh, looking through the two teams, Trev, looking at looking at the locks and the back five that have been picked, in particular, but from your speciality, looking at looking at the the nick the players are in, being an expert on being in, you were always the player who was in the best nick. Uh, what how would you consider these teams as a matchup there? 
Yeah, essentially, I just pulled them up here. You, you, no one can throw them up on the screen, can you? I'm just trying to see so we can compare. Like it, it's uh, it's fascinating the two the two second row combinations. So, um, what kind of rules are we going? When, what kind of era are we playing in here as well? That's the other one I was trying to get my head around. I mean, have we? I think you I think you work off the, the players at the top at the, at their height of their powers. I think you work off. Malo Kelly, it's we're obviously not going to put yeah. Pat Murray up against Simon Zebo now currently because that would be probably unfair. <laughs> and you never know, Zebo might get embarrassed as well if Pat Murray pulls something out of the bag. But I'd say at, at, their, at the height of their powers, looking at the two teams selected, what do you reckon? So, yeah, I, I look at look at Paulie o, O'Connell against Malcolm O'Kelly there. I mean. They would have they would have matched off matched up against each other a lot over the years. It, it's you, you could imagine that that battle again, and, and a lot of it would come down to maybe who's who's partner with Mal, you know, to kind of because Paul would have a, possibly a little bit more abrasiveness and maybe around the park that Malcolm wouldn't have. So maybe Mal would need the t- Tom Hayes to fill in for that, to, to cover that, um, a little bit of that ground. I'd probably lean towards, just by virtue of what Paul has uh, in terms of his competitiveness and his driven nature, I'm not saying that Malcolm doesn't have that, that himself, Paul and, and Golov would probably have the edge on, uh, on Malcolm and Tom Hayes. Now, you know, Malcolm and Tom, both very intelligent, clever operators, not saying they're lacking a hard edge. They just probably don't have the same hard edge that Golov and Paulie would have. Trevor, get off the fence here, man. You just made the longest <laughs> answer to who would win between the two of them, man. Uh, okay, so you're, you're, you're back in, you're back in Golov, and, Golov and Paulie there. Yeah. I still, I, I still have doubts about uh, them winning as much possession potentially in the, in, in, uh, in the lineup than than the other two, you know. And Trevor Brennan, going on to you, you, you obviously, it's no secret that you were considered to be one of the, the tough guys of Irish rugby uh, and French rugby when you were over there as well. So looking at the two sides, and in particular the front rows and the back rows, who were the, who were the standout kind of hard men that were the... Uh, yeah, I was a bit disappointed now Alan out. Quillen made the Munster side ahead of myself now. Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> Keith Wood ahead of Jerry Flannery. So what the fuck's going on, Tal? <laughs> Keith Wood played in the wing most of his career. Um, well, no. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, two, two good teams. Two good teams. Uh, obviously, Peter Clotsy. I'm looking at this. I had, I had to write it down the sheet. Peter Clotsy, obviously, Limerick 15. Yeah, Claw, listen. Uh, I suppose Claw, what he brought, you know, on the pitch, you know, his fighting spirit just incredible. Keith Wood, as I said, uh, you know, great player. He scored a lot of tries, but uh, I, I, I think uh, he missed. Uh, he didn't like uh, being involved in the engine room too much. Uh, I think his job was a hooker. You know, most of his tries were scored on the wing. Uh, John Hayes, obviously, what he brought to the game, the modern game. You know, obviously being six foot three, six foot four. Players like Gunnar Callan and Paul O'Connell have, having a, a guy like him to lift them is just incredible. Uh, you know, Mick Galway again. You know, I mean, Mick wouldn't have been the tallest second row. You know, modern day rugby he might have struggled, but certainly what he gave around the pitch, incredible. Paul O'Connell, just listen, you don't really say anything. You know, I mean, the man just just speaks for himself. Quinny again, just a hard player. Uh, you know, what I mean, I know he wound me up a few times in the in, in the day, but uh, I suppose. Listen, throw a question at me there, lads. If, you know, I don't want to go on too long like Trevor there, but uh, <laughs> I don't yeah. break you, down each player individually. Who, who would you least like to get in a row with, Trevor? Um, never really bothered me, to be honest, but uh, uh, who, who would you fight against? <laughs> but uh, no, probably Jerry Earls, if I was to be honest. He was a tough old cookie. Uh, how that man never got more tops for Munster and how he never got a top for Ireland I'll never, I'll never know like I played against Gerald's in the AL and he was tough as nails like uh, he reminds me be like the Cheslin Colby of rugby today he wasn't a big man but what he, what he gave to you know what I mean putting his body on the line uh, was incredible yeah. pretty good Trev, Trev you were talking up Leams just in terms of getting in rows with lads you know 
you'd, you'd have to be careful. Like, you'd, there'd be the obvious lads you'd want to avoid, maybe the, the, uh, maybe the, the Paulies and the Sean O'Briens. Leamy, you wouldn't want to be in the wrong side, position with, with, with him coming in for a slight dig. Because he's, he is f- fairly, fairly animal strength, you know. So, uh, yeah. You see, it depends as well. I know I keep coming back to this. What, what era? How much could you get away with, you know, in this match or, or when it kicks off? It's, like, for chari- it's for charity. So we can do whatever we want with this. Yeah, yeah, there's yeah. there's, there's going to be no yeah. sightings, no nothings afterwards. So. No, in fairness, I think we, we were lucky, Trevor. We played in the generation, I suppose, before rugby went professional in the 90s. Like, uh, you know, I went away to New Zealand for five months in 93, uh, playing rugby over there. And when I came back, it was just a different beast altogether. Like, the, the, the old studs used to be sharpened up the night before a game and, you know, rucking and stamping. You just wanted to do as much fucking damage as you could to people. <laughs> but, uh, you know, there was no real team. That's what the you know, off, the judges right? was normally a fella from each team. and You got away with murder. But, you know, obviously today the game is can change. It's so controlled. You've got cameras, TMOs. You've got sighting after games. But I think any of us who played, you know, in the amateur era and the professional era, and you, you see the change in both, uh, Obviously, there's times, you know what I mean? Every team needs an enforcer. and You know, Paul O'Connell would be the enforcer, certainly, for uh, for a team. And Al- Alan Quinlan would step up there as well, where you'd have someone like David Wallace to do all the fancy stuff, you know, great footwork. Um, you know I mean, yeah. Peter Clotz, he'd be another massive enforcer. Obviously, going, you know, I'd have Peter Clotz, you had a Jack McGrath, Sean Cronin, I'd probably have, you know... Sean Cronin, I think, yeah, he's he, Jerry would be able to talk more about than I would, but certainly he's a guy, he's, he's fast, he's mobile, uh, he carries a ball. He's, he, I don't know, I think he should have got more caps than he has up to the up to where we are. Rory Best, I don't think, should have got too many as many caps as he did in the last two years. Certainly, I would have had someone Cronin, like you know, horses for courses and things like that, but um. Yeah, go on, lads. Mix it up there. Someone throwing another fucking question. No, well, it's it's we're, we're, we've been we've been going a while. It's it's to see what between the two teams we just get get a prediction from me. So Trev Hogan, give us a prediction. Which team do you think the the Limerick or the Irish team? Who do you think would win it? See, I think the the halfbacks there, Redzer and and Raj, would probably edge it for me. Um, in terms of what they do with the possession, I think the the I can't get away from the era one because I just as I'm looking through it, Keith Woods, Classy, I just feel that Shawnee Cron and Jack McGrath would have the edge on them actually. Um, That's a big call, Trev. Yeah, yeah. Well, like I was, Keith Wood probably won't mind. It was just it's he, the throw the throw wasn't his strength. Uh, would it be fair to say that, like. I'm just readjusting my, my assessment on um, them <laughs> winning as much possession uh, uh, as the others. So based on uh, that as- assumption, which is huge. But Keep, I it short, Keep it short, Trev. Keep it short. I go with, I go with Ar- the Ireland XV is selected by Mick Galway. Just to edge it with, uh, with the halfbacks that they have um, and that stronger pack. Yeah, that's fair. There's a pretty mean backline on that Irish side as well. Uh, Trev B over in France, tell us what yeah, you think. Jerry, I'd probably go for the Limerick side because listen, it didn't matter what fucking team you guys picked, you always just played with heart. And you, you can't beat heart over talent. Like, I don't care what anyone says. Like, if you've got 15 guys who are willing to die for each other on the pitch, it doesn't matter if you're a superstar, second row, back row, out half. You know what I mean? That's what it always was about Munster rugby. Like, um, whether you played against them with Leinster or whether it was against with Toulouse, like, just. You know what I mean? You just knew you were up. It was it was a war, like something just in them guys' heads. Obviously, you guys put on the jersey. You just like you, you took out the disc, the nice disc before the game. You put it in your in your bag, and it was just you put in the disc. It was war, and th- that was it. Like, and you just knew you were always in a battle. Listen, I'd say you could put that Limerick fifteen up against any World fifteen and give them a run for their money. Because again, it just comes down to heart and passion, and you know what I mean. I, 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 that's what I love about Monster Rugby, like, and I think that's what the respect that they have worldwide, all over the world. 
for what they do and you know the, the miracle matches where you know they're, they're not supposed to win and they come back and win and that all comes down to hard lads well, we have we have we have our pundits split so we have a split in the pundits yeah well, yeah yeah he's oh. making a good case there for <laughs> but uh yeah <laughs> i have to stick with what i said uh, i just played your heart in that other group too though yeah, there yeah. Is, yeah you had your chance Trev. you had your chance you uh yeah, you, yeah, you, yeah. you backed the wrong side kid yeah. Listen, I used to go down to to visit Claude Jordan in the summer, so <laughs> I'd be walking around on the street and I'd be wearing a bulletproof jacket, you know? <laughs> uh, all right, okay. lads. Well, look, thanks very much for your time. Really appreciate it. And um, yeah, uh, uh, yeah, thanks thanks very much for uh, for that. And the very best of luck with kind of the rest of um, the, the coronavirus uh, strangeness that's that's going to come over the next while. Trev, the best of luck with the opening up next week. Yeah. And uh, take care of yourselves and your families, and we'll talk to you soon, hopefully.